Hi, everyone. Also, a very warm good morning from my side. So, I have the great honor and pleasure to be the IT officer and chief digital officer of the city of Munich for um, a bit over half a year now. And when I started, um, I had to be elected, so there was a a uh, small but loud campaign before that. And I guess all of you know, most people care only about tech if it doesn't work, right? Um, but I learned and for, uh, before this election that there's uh, two things, actually I knew that before, but it was a very good uh, proof, that there's two things that ignite everyone's attention. If you talk about women in tech, especially feminism, gender language, and in Munich, especially, if you talk about open source, then you have all the attention. Um, and there is no middle ground. There is only good and evil, black and white. Um, so that was an instant interesting experience, starting that job. There's, I have like 100,000 tasks and responsibilities. Like, my department is, responsibility, is responsible for the Wi-Fi in the city's daycare centers. And I'm in charge of the city's smart city strategy for 2050, you name it. So there's really a lot to do. But no, gender language, open source, wah! And then, what there, I, then I got this one email after I got elected and finally could uh, start working in my new office, like the actual office office, not just holding office. Um, and I got this one email from someone working in Munich Tech who was, yeah, um, I have to admit, I was very, very skeptical, like uh, a woman like applying for this job or like being suggested, being nominated for this job. Um, but I have to, have to admit, after seeing you for a few weeks, I think uh, I, have to, um, I have to reconsider my skepticism about genderism. I was like, okay, thanks for letting me know. And then I have great hope in you. Your predecessor murdered Limux. And I hope you will do better. I'm like, okay, <laughs> good talk. So that one was, was my start. And um, not only from people inside the city, but also a lot of journalists, um, when I had the first uh, interviews about my new role, about my plans for the city of Munich, they asked, like, will you bring back open source? And I was really like, you're Heise.de, or like Golem, or whatever. It's like, do I really need to explain to you that Linux is not the only open source software. It's like, yes, the Linux project, which I will talk about in a few um, minutes, um, did not succeed. But what do you think, what do we run on our server farms, right? Like, have you ever like worked in tech actually? So there's a lot of open source, of course, also in the city of Munich. But let's start from not the beginning, but the, like, let's uh, take a little look at what happened to Linux, actually. So yes, the Linux project, as we call it. Can I get, get a quick raise of hands who ever heard of Linux? Okay, so roughly 50-50. So the city of Munich was actually a pioneer and made the decision uh, in 2000, I think even already in 2005, they made the decision to switch all PCs, all operating systems to a customized version of Linux, which was then called Linux from Munich, right? Um, unfortunately, one legislation later, they decided to roll back that decision, which I think was very sad, was very unfortunate. There were even big consulting houses like Accenture saying, like, don't do that, you'll lose a lot of money. But it was done anyway, politics, right? So yes, Linux, unfortunately, is dead. So why did it not work out? Pretty much everything was wrong, unfortunately. It was a great idea. It was really super impressive. And I think there were a lot of people all around Germany, even in Europe, who were looking at Munich and like really impressed by a public government deciding to go open source. But beyond the decision itself, there was a lot of um, yeah, hurdles or like uh, uh, block stones that were not addressed properly. So back then, 
it wasn't really the time for Linux and desktop, right? And, was, and maybe desktop would have not been, or like the operating system, where a lot of people that have nothing to do with tech and don't want to do anything to do with tech, their, their job is to, I don't know, help people fill the forms to renew their passport or like a uh, map where the next construction has to take place. They don't want to care about their tech. They don't want to, they, they want to use the computer in their office as they use the computer at home and what they use at home is rarely Linux. So that maybe was aimed a little too high and there was no appropriate change management. So for both um, op uh, the, the operating system and office. And um, we didn't make it better by not just changing these two, but also trying to really, I mean, the, the idea was good, right? Really to, to go open source all the way. So we changed all the letterhead sounds so easy, but actually if you've ever seen public government from inside, you know that forms, that like standard forms are one of the most essential tools. So we tried to change that as, way, as well. And uh, that was just too much. And also the, the way we did it was just too, too technical. Like we did it on our own platform. We tried to host it or build it all ourselves and didn't really see the future. Like today we have web apps and all that stuff. And that was like very like on-premise um, <coughs> desktop based. So yeah, um, there were a lot of things, but in retrospective, you're always smarter, right? But what I think was the most fundamental problem is that it wasn't considered enough that this is not just new software, that this is really a clash of paradigms. Like you have public government, which is very hierarchical, which relies heavily on fixed structures. Like every person in every role has a very fixed responsibility, fixed tasks. And actually, flexibility, if you work in public government, is a punishable offense, right? Um, so it's, it's not just not built in, it's prohibited. And then you try to like, kind of like marry that with a world that lives on flexibility, on openness, on inclusion, on, um, yeah, that, that does not, not only not rely on fixed structures, but is based structureless, more or less. Like, I'm exaggerating both sides, but you get the point. So to make Linux a success, I think we would have had to do a lot of more better change management of really like open the mindsets of people in government, in the um, administration to understand that approach, to make them feel like, okay, what they consider a bug is not actually a failure, but is intended to be flexible, adaptable, changeable, which can, of course, also be good things, but if you just confront them, they will push back. So that's what happened and got pushed back. But it was not just a fail. As I initially said, by getting rid of Linux again, it's not that we got rid of open source for once and for all everywhere. Of course, we use a lot of open source tools in all our tech. But I think that Linux, Linux project also um, gave a lot of wind to a existing community that got strengthened within the city, within the administration, where they felt like, okay, like maybe we can do something. Maybe this is really wanted. And even though this big project is not running anymore, let's see what else we can do. And actually today, we not only use a lot of open source, we actually produce open source ourselves. So these are just a couple of examples that I want to give you. Um, so DigiVF stands for Digital Workforce, um, is a Komunda-based workflow automation system um, that we use, or that we actually, we are already using for a couple of processes that, and that we want to use as the basis for really end-to-end -end digital processes in the administration. Then uh, from within my department, a, a small team just launched a conflict resolution app. It sounds very, um, it has nothing to do with like actual big conflicts. 
Um, but with like smaller, like if you have a problem within your team, if you don't know who is the right person to go to, if you have an issue at work, um, then this like navigates you because public government, like I said a lot of structures, we have several um, places where you go to if you have health issues, if you have uh, psychological issues, if you have issues with like uh, um, work-life balance, with like managing job and kids. So to find all these, and of course we have like mediation and there's um, disciplinary stuff. Stuff. So to navigate all these resources, um, they developed an app and that is available open source. We have a uh, daycare um, planning system that is uh, rolled out all through the city that is uh, used to find daycare spots and primary school spots. And um, we just recently launched a map for accessible public toilets called Inclus. We did that together with the team from the TU in Munich, the Technical University, and uh, plan to also um, yeah, roll that out to further cities or like make it available to other cities. Like I said, just a couple examples. Check out our GitHub. So in the summary to my talk, um, I described, or my team helped me describe, how public administration benefits from open source. And I think a lot of you already know <laughs> that there's huge potential, um, but let, let's look at a few aspects of that. So if we look at public government, it's called public, right? So making it more transparent should actually be the aim of every authority. And if you look at what we today um, yeah, rather negatively describe as bureaucracy, that system was intended. So it is literally the same system, the same processes for everyone. So it is fair. And they probably, Max Weber probably wouldn't have talked about transparency, but the intention was similar to make it fair for everyone. And today, I think if we consider something fair, most of us would assume that we get to understand how it works. So if we apply that to the software that we develop, because we're not only using software, as I just described, we also develop a lot of stuff, either because there's nothing available on the market um, that we need or because we have our own ideas. So by developing public from the start, everyone can see, everyone can try out. And if we do it open source, like in the proper way, people can contribute. And I think decreasing these um, felt barriers between the authorities and the people is hugely important, not just in tech, but I think like closing that gap is fundamental to our democracy and to all democracy, because actually, because you know what happens if people like tend to get into the extremes and say like, this government, I don't have anything to do with them. So we don't want it. And I think um, open source can be a small part also helping to close that gap. And of course, we need the support, or we don't only need, but we have it. Like I said, there is a growing and a very active open source community within the Munich Tech Department. And if we have policymakers that actually support it and push it and said, look, okay, we as the elected officials, we want that, then we actually can uh, make a lot of good things work. Cooperation. So not only do we do this within Munich, but in a growing age of digitalization, we need to work with other municipalities because in, uh, in Germany with its 16 states and uh, I think over 200 um, cities that uh, work their own systems, it just like from a tech perspective, it doesn't make sense like if everyone develops their own systems, right? So of course we can all buy from big tech and have all the same, but we wouldn't be here if that we would think that that would be the best solution. So working together on open source solutions can actually be super powerful. And these are uh, two more um, examples. So the e-appointment is uh, something that uh, Berlin and Munich work together with since two years. It's uh, open source based. Um, I know it's, uh, it has uh, still some uh, room for improvement but from an open source perspective, it is a good example. And then with Dave, um, a, a traffic load, load count management system that we um, developed together with the city of um, Augsburg. So also one of our neighboring cities. 
And I personally hope that we see many, many more of these examples. Um, so last year was the year of the OZG, the Offenes Zugangsgesetz, which said or demanded from authorities, from administrations, that all processes would be available digitally for the people in Germany. We didn't really get there, <laughs> but we are on our way. And um, I personally think that open source could um, boost that tremendously if we could really come to this exchange. But that also is a huge cultural change because big cities were not used to, to just like exchange and work together. They, they all worked in their silo and they all knew like, I mean, you can get a passport or you have to be able to get a passport in every city, right? But they all have different systems. So like, um, yeah, making use of scaling effects would be really desirable. And again, I think open source would be a great way if we try to, to um, make that, um, yeah, that, that cultural and that mind shift. Talking about culture. So again, we start where we have uh, the, the responsibility, um, the possibilities also, so within our own organization. But of course, we have the bigger FOSS community in our mind. So in my IT department in the city of Munich, we encourage everyone to participate in existing free software projects. And we have the clear um, goal and guiding principle that wherever technically or financially possible, we rely on open standards and use open source software. And my big, um, yeah, what I try to preach is that it's not this like black and white, like either you're like for open source or you're for Microsoft and there's no middle ground. Um, that's not the reality and that I, yeah, I like repeat and repeat and repeat it all the time to really get people to understand that, um, of course, it's not realistic to like switch tomorrow everything to open source. It's not even possible, right? Um, and it might not even be the, the ideal scenario, even it would be possible, because there might be some proprietary software that is just so much better than everything else. But um, just relying on proprietary software can also not be the solution, because then we also exclude ourselves from a lot of um, existing good software that's out there. And if we want to, uh, to follow the, the basic idea of public money, public code, then we cannot just spend money for closed code. So this is how we address this like paradigm shift, but rather step by step, but not with this like big clash because we saw it fail. So I want to give you a few examples of what we have recently uh, decided and established. Here comes one um, where I usually um, shrug a little because it's one of these buzzwords. Um, it's not as bad as blockchain, um, <laughs> but <laughs> digital sovereignty is also, um, I think, a little uh, overused. But then again, I tell myself, like, okay, Reddit and pushback, try like how we can work together. And there is a lot of way how we can work together. So the city of Munich, like a lot of other cities, aims to be sovereign also with this tech stack. So, okay, instead of just like going here and challenging, like, really, like, what do you actually mean with that? I'm like, okay, that's great. And do you, think, do you know what I think we need for that? So it's not just about like, getting rid of or like um, decreasing dependencies on big tech companies. We can actually do that by using more open source. <laughs> kind of like uh, sneak that in. So um, there's a lot of existing open source we can use and we can of course ourselves contribute and strengthen that community within our tech but also like the, the worldwide community. So that is kind of like a um, that pill is a little easier to swallow for a lot of people than just like open source, open source, open source, because then they get the, the feeling like we don't have arguments, it's just for the sake of it. Um, but if you, if you connect that, if you put it into a bigger um, picture, then they actually understand. And I think you can see that also in the, in the bigger landscape. I mean, there's a lot of the... the, the um, Ministry for the Interior right now is developing a open source 
um, workplace for public administration. I mean, that tells you a lot how far we got. So you see that that um, resistance towards open source just out of principle has not disappeared, but dis decreased a lot. And I think it's imp important to like jump on these existing narratives and like kind of like find um, ways in instead of like yeah trying to like go all the way immediately. One other big thing that I always say is uh, fundamental to digital sovereignty is not just the tech itself, it's also education about tech. So in my understanding, my belief, a city, a municipality, a state, a country cannot be digital sovereign without educated people. So if, if we just all use whatever our apps put on our screens, um, then I don't think we can talk about really educated users and we cannot really talk about independence if we rely just so much on what other people like push on our screens. So that's for me another very important pillar to educate. And of course, educating people about the difference between proprietary and open source and like what is behind the idea of public money, public code is a very important part of that education. Okay, small uh, excurs. Back to what we are doing in Munich. So we have um, three big projects that we started um, started last year. Um, two are up to launch now. So one is the um, we call it the open source factory, um, which is uh, two employees really dedicated to FOSS. We're partnering with the Technical University, and we want to develop open source tools projects that can be shared with other municipalities. Um, one of the projects that includes map that um, accessible accessibility map that I uh, talked about before came out of that open source factory. Then within my department, we have the open source hub where we try to connect people within Munich's IT department. I think I didn't mention that there's over a thousand people working in the city of Munich on the city's tech. So that is quite a large organization. So we have this hub to connect these people and to like educate and to motivate because of course there's some developers they're, they're working maybe for like, I don't know, two, three decades, four decades sometimes. And if you all of a sudden tell them, okay, I want your code public, they're like, Ugh. it's kind of like if the boss stands behind their screen watching them, that's how they feel. So you need to take that fear away, right? So that hub tries to like cultivate a positive atmosphere and to also make our open source efforts more visible. Actually, this question, uh, my colleague Klaus in the back there is a part of that open source hub. And then we also want you to be part of Munich's open source initiative. So um, thanks to the elected um, people in Munich City Hall, we could just launch a open source sabbatical where we want to strengthen, of course, our own open source projects, but also contribute to other open source projects that we might maybe using in the city or could be using in the, in the future. And um, we not only <laughs> want to like benefit from that and get, but we also actually can pay people. So I think that's a really cool and uh, innovative project for a public administration um, to give people from our own administrations, or be it from the tech department or other departments, but also people from outside, the opportunity to work on open source projects and get paid. So of course, if that sounds inter interesting to you, um, please let us know and please come apply. Munich is a beautiful city. And that, I'm already at the end. Um, this is all our channel. I should have put our GitHub there. And yes, I should have put Mastodon there on there too. Um, it's on my to-do list. I have to apologize for now. It's uh, all these beautiful channels. I think we have a few minutes for Q&A, but for now, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Thank you, really wonderful talk. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Hi, uh, thank you very much for your talk, it was really interesting. So I was wondering, um, I'm working also with Dutch municipalities, 
So how uh, the sharing with the other municipalities currently works, you know, what's the kind of, is there an umbrella organization that kind of <laughs> takes care of it? Because I realized through the years that was always the problem. Yeah, the, the, still the municipalities want to the, uh, invent their own wheel. Can you say something about yeah. that? Um, so far, there is no um, actual umbrella organization. I would um, like for that to happen. There is something in the works um, like a um, uh, yeah, GitHub for public administration in Germany, but that then is only available if you are in the administration, which from my standpoint is a little like, it's not as open anymore, right? Um, but I think that could be a good start to also like make people trust, like, okay, like, what is this crazy GitHub? Okay, here's something where, it, where it's only for public administrations. Um, but right now, mainly it relies really on personal contacts, which is a shame because that does not really scale forever. But right now it's, it's still more a, a grassroots approach. Um, but I think right now I see a lot of um, happening right now in that space. So um, the, the state of Munich is uh, developing a, um, it's called the Bayern, not the state of the state of Bavaria, the, um, uh, the Bayern cloud um, to get rid of Microsoft Teams in schools. And that has developed open source. So that would not have been imaginable like 10 years ago. But um, I absolutely agree. We need A, we need more standards for government tech. And um, we need better ways to, to actually foster that exchange. So it not, does not rely on like individual contacts. We have another question here. Hi, uh, first of all, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I just had one question. Um, I don't know if you're able to provide like some examples on how City of Munich is addressing uh, the open source cultural change like within the, the employee, not the employees, but all the public servants and so on. Yeah. Um, so you mean within the, the tech department or the, the overall city? Uh, the tech department yeah. and the overall, because every every team will speak a different language. Absolutely. So in the overall city administration, we kind of like really like um, scale back a lot. Like basically um, the, the regular municipal employee um, has no touch point with open source. Maybe they do, but then they don't know it. For example, if they, if they um, ask for um, permission for, a, for a, a business trip or a um, uh, um, Fortbildung, um, a, a educational program for approval, that is already working on DGVF, but they don't know it, right? It, to them, it looks like a web app. Um, that's it. Within the tech uh, department, we have a lot of um, initiatives, like uh, what I just mentioned, like this open source app. We actually have one, our um, chief um, archi architect is also our um, officially our, our open source um, ambassador. So making it visible and um, showing support. I think this is really the, the most important, like you can have a lot of like programs and stuff, but if, if people don't feel that it's really backed, like by management and also by the uh, policy makers, then I think you won't get a lot. But we do have that um, backing, like from the, the town hall um, and of course from the, from the top management of the tech department. And um, we also plan a lot of like low key things. Like for example, we recently discussed like, okay, for like maybe um, uh, the person who commits the most on GitHub, um, uh, we invite them for like a uh, afternoon coffee party in, in, the, um, in my office or something like that um, to, to actually just show support. So I think it's both like, like, and I think that's why you asked, like we need the like official programs and initiatives and we really need the, the cultural support. And let me add one last thing. Um, so how to deal with mistakes, I think, is a huge topic because um, I'm new to public government, right? I'm doing this for half a year now. And what I already learned is people are extremely risk averse. They do not want to take risks. They are so afraid of making mistakes, even though their jobs are as, as safe and as secure as they can possibly be. So really, 
encouraging them that it's okay that not everything is immediately perfect and that we want them to try and experiment is super important. And, but I think that also is something that you need to, to live and make visible, that it it's doesn't help if you write down, it is okay to make a mistake and bury it in a drawer. But um, this is one of the most difficult things to change in the mindset. Thank you. Um, we also have some online questions. Oh, sorry. Um, I'll just ask one from online and then we'll go back to the in-room question. So, um, I mean, you, um, um, you presented also some open source projects that you develop yourself, but do you also um, support other open source projects, uh, existing ones? And um, the question is, um, how do you decide um, which projects um, you support? Yeah. <clears throat> So, um, supporting by people that, that add to projects, that definitely also happens, um, but we do not track that. Um, we, do, we do let people know that it's okay to also do that in their, in their work time. Um, what we just started is to financially contribute to um, some projects, which is... Um, also hard because you need to discuss them with the city treasurer and it's like, but if it's for free, why, why should we pay for it? It's like, okay. <laughs> um, um, but we actually started um, supporting on a regular basis some of the, the libraries um, that we use a lot. Okay, thanks. And then we can go back to in-room questions. I think we have one here. Yeah, thanks for your great examples from Munich. Um, Thank you. And I love your um, sabbatical program. I know it from 2019 or 2020 when there was the first idea about it and now it's brought to life. That's very cool. Um, That's how long it takes in public administration. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there already some applications for it and are there already some people who make use of the program? No, because uh, you just said it was uh, in the works for long. There were a lot of like legal concerns um, and we, we finally officially got the approval I think uh, two months ago, um, and we're also like piloting it. Um, so we will have the first, um, hopefully, the first people using that sabbatical next year, and we will start um, the application phase end of summer or end of this year. Okay, thanks. Of course. We have quite some. Um, <laughs> we have one back there. <laughs> I also have a, a question about the sabbatical. Uh, do you also allow for other roles, not only engineering roles, because we all know that open source needs more than just engineering power? Yes, I am. Uh, I, I do not have the, the text of the um, uh, decree, um, but I'm pretty sure that it's um, uh, designed in a way that allows allows not only developers. And we already had the first uh, discussion, like we're starting with like two slots and um, it was like, okay, should we have a quota? And I'm a big fan of quotas, but I said like, okay, two people, let's maybe, let's, let's uh, commit that we want to have a, a diverse pool of uh, candidates for the sabbatical. Maybe I'll take one online question and then we'll have another one here. Um, so the question is, um, are there policies in place to promote open source outside of public offices designed to stimulate the use and contribution of citizens? Um, there are no policies directly um, that specific, but as we have our policy that wherever possible we want to use open source. Um, so, for example, um, we are just experimenting with uh, different tools for citizens' participation. And um, we try to use, of course, open source there as well, so people interact with open source without knowing that it's open source, which I think is most cases the, the better way than like um yeah giving that them that big lecture i said before like education about open source is super important um but i see that a little bit separate from like every single use case they ever have okay thanks and then i'll give the mic here yeah thanks for the uh, talk in the very beginning you were talking about the different 
uh, hierarchy models and I, I asking myself, so if Munich is doing learning how to deal with open source, what are the problems? Um, what are the information channels uh, between different German or even European cities to share this information? And is there a network of cities? And on a technical level, how is this organized? That's a very similar question to the colleague before. Unfortunately, there is no robust structure yet. It relies a lot of on, on personal connections, on connection between cities. Like, for example, Augsburg is a city where we have a lot exchange anyway. It's quite close. Um, it's under the same <laughs> legislation. Um, and um, yeah, a lot of the projects are in GitHub. But of course, then you need to be in the know about open source to really make use of that. Um, there are, like I also said, um, really from the from the very top of um, German government, a lot of uh, positive push and efforts to promote open source. Um, but uh, right now, I think there there's a lot of development, and I very much hope that there is going to be a more more structured um, exchange. I, I dare to say co-creation. Um, in, in the future, because that's needed to really, like, um, yeah, to, to get to the next level, to not have just like, um, yeah, grassroots hands-on. Um, thank you very much, Laura, for that presentation. I have. Um, so you started by saying uh, that the Limux, uh, the Lin uh, Limux, yeah. Limux. Sorry, I was there when that happened, and uh, unfortunately, I think you will agree with me that that sent. Uh, massive and active shock waves uh, through uh, all the projects that were looking forward to seeing that as a success. Uh, do you think that uh, current initiatives will have positive uh, implications for other uh, cities or regional governments? Like that, Munich could give back uh, some of that as a, as a countermeasure to what happened back in 2007. Yeah, I mean, that's why I'm here, right? To, to show that it's not just all in, in shambles. Um, I totally agree with the shockwaves, but like, and it's easy to say that like a couple of years later being not involved, but um, for most people in the administration, it was seen as a like out of principle political push to like force that crappy software on them. So of course they pushed back. Um, and I think we learned a lot from that to um, to really like start with like smaller projects that actually work to not like rub it in people's faces that you have to use open source but just create good open source or use good open source um, tools um, but I also see it as my personal mission to like really go around and say like okay Linux itself failed but there were a lot of good things coming out of that and there is actually a lot of like um, yeah kind of like you you, you <laughs> The, the plant got chopped, but the roots are there and they're actually spreading and there's a lot of more like growing out of it now. And I mean, I talked about like um, uh, a culture of like uh, failure and acceptance before. And of course, then we need to, we can't just like go back in our closet and cry and like, oh, it failed, but <laughs> I need to stand on stage and say, okay, um, this does not work out. And we learn from it and we try new things. Thank you. Is there any other um, question? Yeah, I think <laughs> we'll take another one from the person that didn't ask yet. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, and I, I was wondering how you were thinking perhaps about the process of maintenance. I, I know you're in the advocacy stage and the implementation phase, but um, do you have an ear to you know the lifetime of of um, the projects that you're working, how you might think through the maintenance process. As I know that funding cycles for, for governments have a longer lifetime than perhaps usual funding or tech cycles, but yeah, um, yeah have an ear to that timeline. Thank you. It's one of the arguments that we um, usually bring um, when it's um, about the decision which, which software to, um, to procure to, to use for big city projects. Um, and uh, previously, it was seen like there's no company behind it, so we can't trust it. And we're trying to make the case like, okay, there, there is actually a, a, there's a big community, and B, the code is ours whenever we, we want or need it. Um, and uh, what I briefly mentioned before, that we're starting actually also like financially contributing on a regular basis, not just one time, um, to some projects is part of that as well. 
Great. Um, I think the time is up now. Um, so let's thank Laura one more time for this wonderful talk. Thank you.